my name is Lauren Smith and I am a self-advocate and I'm going to be presenting on autism, joint hypermobility, and orthostatic intolerance. Here's my disclaimer. So just first, just a little outline. First, we're going to go over key terms and concepts. Um, we're going to go over the significance of my project, uh, my central questions, participants, how I assess joint hypermobility and orthostatic intolerance, procedures, data analysis, results, and next steps. So to start off, just to define uh, joint hypermobility and orthostatic intolerance for you guys. Um, joint hypermobility means that some or all of a person's joints have unusually large range of motion. This is also often referred to as having loose joints or being double jointed. Orthostatic intolerance is defined by the inability to tolerate the upright posture because of signs and symptoms relieved by laying down. So this can look like uh, dizziness, blurred vision, weakness, fatigue, trouble concentrating, and head and neck discomfort when standing up. Um, so research has found that autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions carry an increased vulnerability to physical health problems. A recent study found a strong link between joint hypermobility and orthostatic intolerance in adults with neurodevelopmental conditions. The study found that females with neurodevelopmental conditions were 3.5 times more likely to have joint hypermobility. A lack of understanding of this association affects patients' well being. So for central questions, I wanted to investigate, what is the occurrence of joint hypermobility and orthostatic intolerance in individuals with autism spectrum disorder? Secondly, are joint hypermobility and orthostatic intolerance more common in individuals assigned female at birth? Finally, are individuals with autism spectrum disorder screened for joint hypermobility and orthostatic intolerance? So uh, these are our participants. We had a total of 14 individuals. 79% uh, of the sample was female or assigned female at birth. Uh, ages range from 11 to 64 years of age. The sample was primarily white and 64% had a diagnosis of autism. So for assessing joint hypermobility, traditionally, the Byton scoring system is used to measure hypermobility, and this usually involves the movement of several joints and the joints range of movement is measured. Um, as I am not an MD and I didn't get to see the patients in person, I opted for a more simple questionnaire to detect hypermobility. This five-part questionnaire was tested and designed as an alternative to the Byton scale. So it's five questions and um, answering yes to two or more of these questions suggested they met criteria for hypermobility. Um, to assess orthostatic intolerance, there is no widely accepted validated scale for this. Um, however, the Orthostatic hypotension questionnaire can accurately evaluate the severity of orthostatic hypotension. And orthostatic hypotension is a type of orthostatic intolerance signaled by low blood pressure. So therefore I use the hypotension questionnaire to measure intolerance. So this questionnaire is a six item symptom assessment scale that assesses the symptoms of orthostatic hypotension. The patient rates how severe their symptoms have been over the past week on a scale of zero to 10, from none to worst possible. Uh, symptoms assessed include dizziness, blurred vision, weakness, fatigue, trouble concentrating, and head and neck discomfort. So for procedures, um, I used a Qualtrics survey 
which asked about demographics, autism diagnosis, joint hypermobility score, and orthodontic score, and whether they had um, any previous screening. This was distributed to the Developmental Behavioral Pediatric Clinic, as well as the Mind Institute Facebook page, and to my fellow trainees. Um, this was a between subjects descriptive observational design. For the data analysis, I used uh, four different tests to assess the relationship between the variables. I used, first used a chi square test for independence to examine whether autism is related to hypermobility. I then used an independent groups t-test to examine whether individuals with and without autism differ in their severity of their orthostatic intolerance symptoms. A second chi-square test for independence was used to examine whether sex at sign of birth is related to hypermobility. And finally, an independent groups t-test was used to examine whether males and females differ in severity of orthostatic intolerance symptoms. So these are my results. Um, on the left, you can see the, the variables that were compared, as well as their p-values and effect size. So effect size, um, if you look at the p-values, you can see that um, none of them reach statistical significance, um, but I thought it was still important to highlight the uh, strength of the relationship between the variables. So for example, um, as you can see, between autism and orthostatic intolerance, we found a large relationship. Um, so this is a pretty strong relationship, as well as a relationship between sex and hypermobility. Um, interestingly, none of the participants reported having been screened for joint hypermobility or orthostatic intolerance in the past. So because the data analysis yielded results that are not statistically significant, I cannot infer about the population. However, from our data, there may be a relationship between autism and orthostatic intolerance with those with autism experiencing more severe symptoms. There may also be a relationship between sex assigned at birth and joint hypermobility with joint hypermobility being more common in those assigned female at birth. And finally, individuals with autism are not frequently screened for these physical health problems. So these results are consistent with prior research on autism, joint hypermobility, and orthostatic intolerance. The biggest limitation of the study was sample size. Further research should include a sample size of at least 30 individuals to reduce type two error. The generality of these results must be established by future research. The present study has provided support for the need of screening to improve clinical practice. I would like to thank the LEND program and my fellow trainees, Alvin Stammer, my mentors Bibiana and Kiki, and everyone who completed the survey. These are my citations. And this is my contact information. I don't know whether any of the autism patients had a fragile X mutation because we've written many papers about joint hyperextensibility and also orthostatic problems, particularly in pre-mutation carriers. So anybody with lowered FMRP is likely to have these problems together. We're doing a grant now to look at FMRP levels uh, across the fragile X spectrum and also in autism, but um, this is a very important um, uh, connection, at least those with uh, lowered FMRP. Do you know whether anybody was a a carrier. We've even uh, reported on Ehlers-Danlos being uh, diagnosed uh, earlier on 
before the premutation in individuals uh, with the premutation. And of course, those with the full mutation have major problems with hyperextensibility, but the premutation carriers talk more about the orthostatic uh, problems. Yeah, so um, I in this study, I did not specifically look at other um, neurodevelopmental conditions, but it is assumed that um, the, they would have similar findings. Um, and I love that you bring up Elhurst Danlos. Um, I, the reason why I, I resisted just questioning whether um, individuals had a diagnosis of Elhurst Danlos is because it can be very hard to get a diagnosis of Elhurst Danlos. Um, and so I went with joint hypermobility as like a more accessible, like lesser version of that. Um, but does that answer your question? Yeah, but in a sense, it's not another condition. The premutation and the full mutation are known causes of autism. Yes. Um, yeah, so that would be an interesting thing to look into in the future. I agree. Very nice talk. Thanks, Ron. Thank I think that Katrine had her hand up. Oh, she changed her I think, mind. I think it's already been answered. Thank you, though. A very interesting topic. Uh, in the chat, Kiki had a question. How do we ask to be screened for orthostatic and hypermobility? Um, and what, what do we get with the testing? What are the benefits? Sure. Um, for From my own personal experience, I kind of just had to bring it up to my primary care doctor um, who then referred me to specialists. Um, I find that most doctors are not very familiar with um, like the criteria for this. So I've even like printed out the diagnostic criteria and brought it to my doctor. Um, you can get that um, for the joint hypermobility mobility. I got it from the Elher Stanlos Society website. Um, and I can show you where I got the questionnaire for the orthostatic intolerance. Um, so I think really the benefits is like these conditions don't necessarily have a cure yet. Um, so our real goal is to uh, reduce pain and improve functionality. Um, so usually if you have joint hypermobility, they might recommend physical therapy. Um, and for orthostatic intolerance, there's a lot of uh, lifestyle changes that can help you manage your symptoms. Thank you. Looks like Suma and then Christine, and those will probably be our last questions for you, Lauren. I think Christine had a hand up first, but I'll, okay, I'll go. Um, thank you for the interesting discussion. I just wanted to comment on the hypermobility itself. Addressing Randy's um, comment also that about one to two percent of autism, Randy, it could be higher, I guess, um, may have fragile X premutation or fragile X itself. And I'm guessing they're being checked for that. But to address the question of Ehler Danlos syndrome, that's a very specific genetic diagnosis. And there are many different types of Ehler Danlos syndrome. So all of them cannot be um, clubbed into one group. And if somebody has giant hypermobility, that's fairly common in the general population. And it could be as high as one in five in typical population in children. And that hypermobility is higher in, in children and it could decrease with time. So there are very specific diagnostic criteria for something Ehlers Danlos hypermobility type, which I think is what you are referring to, because the other ones, the classic type or the vascular type of EDS or the Ehlers Danlos syndrome, have um, more, much more serious health implications in terms of vascular rupture or. Uh, yeah, uh, internal organ ruptures, especially for the vascular type. But, um, but it's an interesting thing to look into and ask as a question and to differentiate between 
the syndromic type versus maybe more um, of the common variety of hypermobility. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Christine, do we have time for me? I'll be quick. Um, this was super interesting, Lauren, and I um, I, I really appreciate this. And, and um, I'm thinking about the, so I run this study called GAIN at, at the mind where we have this cohort of girls, that, autistic girls that we're looking at. And just anecdotally, my team and I have just noticed like we see a lot of girls come in with like ankle braces and 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 things like this that indicate some sort of sprain or injury that that we we're like we don't really see this in our boys that we see so so this is super interesting to me and I'm and I was I'm gonna go in we do a med exam with our girls and so wanting to know how we if we assess hypermobility in that med exam but I'm curious I mean we have this cohort of girls coming in and we could potentially just ask them about it. Um, and so I'd like to connect with you to get your question, you know, the questions that you ask them. And it could just be something interesting to, to look into since we're already seeing them. But thank you very much. The UC Davis Mind Institute was founded in 1998 with the promise to reduce and prevent the disabilities that can be associated with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Every day, our clinicians and researchers make progress on that promise. Our groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other conditions associated with disability are helping affected individuals achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website or our social media platforms to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.